Uh, we're talking about uh, the changes that are happening right now when it comes to the vaccines, right? They're now being named. It's not just Pfizer, AstraZeneca. No, no, now it is. Pfizer becomes Comirnaty. The modern vaccine, the Moderna vaccine will be named Spikevax. That sounds like a Halloween costume. I'm going out of Spikevax. And then AstraZeneca vaccine is going to be called the Vaxaria. Uh, you know what? Someone with a degree, a lot smarter than me, probably learned all these crazy pronunciations in med school. Dr. Ray Watt, <laughs> DNA and an epidemiologist and science communicator. Maybe the emphasis is on the science communication here. <laughs> you know what? Anchors have been practicing this from coast to coast because, and it, it, be honest, even in our own newsroom, how do you say that? What the heck are they thinking, Dr. Ray? Good morning. You say it, Dionandin. That's how it's pronounced. It's just... <laughs> <laughs> to, to set the you, record straight. You, you want a vaccine named after you now? <laughs> sure. You me? To set the record straight, I did not go to medical school. I'm a PhD, not a medical doctor. Just okay. So, so people are going to complain okay. about that. Just So, so here, oh. here's why it's kind of good news that they chose these new names. You only get a new name when you've been officially authorized to sell your product. That means that this is no longer an emergency use authorization product. It's a, a fully licensed, non-experimental product. So that takes some wind out of the sails of the anti-vaxxers who claim this is an experimental vaccine. It's not. So um, that transition from generic name to brand name sends that signal. But most people don't realize that. So, uh, yeah. so how much good will it do? I don't know. And I, frankly, I don't think people are going to use the new names. I think, why not call it Pfizer Vax or Moderna Vax, something similar? Uh, that, I guess marketing people need jobs, so this is what they do. Well, could it be? Well, and they're they're picking tough ones to pronounce. They always do with with drugs and patents and so on, right? I mean, that's hard. They make it hard for everybody, <laughs> except doctors. Yeah, I suppose so. I suppose so. I mean, look, why do we call epinephrine adrenaline? Why do we call ibuprofen Advil? So other people might make the same product later on when it's off brand, but cannot lay claim to the brand. So it's strictly a you know a, a capitalist branding issue. It's not really a scientific issue. Could we say that this is because as they're tweaking boosters and so on with a, you know, a new formula that maybe they're getting ready to roll out and it'll be a different Pfizer, AstraZeneca, et cetera? Oh, that's interesting. I hadn't thought about that. I suppose that's possible. I doubt it. It might be Comirnaty Plus or something like that. But uh, as someone on Facebook put it out to me, what do you do with people with mixed doses? If you've got Comirnaty Plus, one of the other ones, are you a, a commie vax, which does not sound great. So no. <laughs> they should think this through better. Yeah, no kidding. And but it, I still don't understand why they pick complica complicated. I mean, if it's based in Russia, and it's you know I get it, but I mean these are for the most part aren't they American and British? Sure, I like Spike Vax sounds great. Yeah, exactly. And like I said, I'm going down Halloween as one. <laughs> <laughs> and to me, Vaxavia sounds like a, a fictional Eastern European country in the Marvel universe. Or uh, or an STD. <laughs> sure, there's that. Community is a drunken person saying community. So there, yeah. you know, there's some levity here. Yeah, there is some liberty here. Uh, Dr. Ray, we're seeing some increase in schools when it comes to COVID cases. We were warned it was going to happen. Um, still no, not mandatory for teachers and staff, anyone over the age of 12 going into these buildings. However, uh, some boards have took it, taken it upon themselves to do that. Uh, what are your thoughts? As we know, there are 500 cases uh, and a couple of, aside from isolated cl classrooms, a couple of school closings along the way as well. I think we should have mandated vaccination for people working with kids. So, so mm. educational workers, people inside the schools, not for kids necessarily, but for the adults around them. That would have solved some of this problem. I think we still have time to institute better mitigation tools, especially rapid testing. That's not been fully accentuated yet because uh, rapid testing allows us to identify people who are infectious that given day and take them out of circulation before they cause further for the spread. So we have the tools to control this. I'm not sure why we're not using them to the fullest extent that we can. Well, rapid testing, even if everybody were double vaccinated, they would still be a, a tool, or the test would still be a tool that would be helpful in, in spreading, in stopping the spread. Exactly right. So vaccinated yeah. people are much likely to be infected, but if they are infected, then they carry the same viral load as unvaccinated people, meaning that at the time of peak infectiousness, they're equally as infectious. They're just infectious for a shorter period of time. So testing vaccinated people makes sense if the goal here is to take infectious people out of circulation on a given day. So here, here's the question. Uh, we see that when kids do get get the virus, they don't get as sick. That is probably the most reassuring piece of, of, of knowledge that parents take with them as they try to balance the choices. Do I go online with my kids? Do I keep them in schools? And we all know that keeping them in schools is the priority for basically everybody with few 
exceptions. Uh, is that a safe bet, or as we're seeing in some parts of the world, kids can get sick too? I, I don't know if it's a safe bet. Um, even if it is a safe bet, uh, we're talking here about proportions. So the proportion of infected kids who will be hospitalized, let's say it's low. Um, the thing about Delta is it's high, highly transmissible, as everybody knows. As a result, it infects a lot more kids. Therefore, a small proportion of a large number is a large number. So you're going to get a lot more kids who are going to be seriously sick, even if the proportion remains low. And that's intolerable. So mm. it's in our best interest to minimize exposure of children until we figure out if we can vaccinate kids, as we will figure out soon. Um, but that's the, that should be the plan right now. You know what's happening in Alberta. It's a crisis there. And to the point where Ontario said, yeah, we'll take some patients like we, we did before here in Ottawa for the GTA. Uh, is, is it mean that we're going to be affected? We're going to be affected in the sense that our capacity is going to be taxed to some extent, um, as it should be. We need to share the burden here. Absolutely. It's not the patient's fault that you know their leaders made some poor decisions. Uh, but this is a shared Canadian-wide endeavor. The thing about pandemics in general is that the resources of a nation get spread across that nation. It's not a localized epidemic. This is expected. So we need, for future pandemics, better planning for moving of resources rapidly across the country like this, including healthcare capacity. Today's case numbers have just come out. I'm curious. You know, we've seen them inch up, inch up. We're at 795 across the province, 64 in Ottawa. What does that say to you, Dr. Ray? Well, it's kind of what we expected from the modeling. Remember, there may be a slight decoupling from cases from hospitalizations because of vaccination, but we still have a large unvaccinated population that will drive the hospitalization rate. That's the troubling part of this. Again, we have time uh, in the sense that we have a, an option here. And the option is drive vaccination as high as we can in the short run. So in the next month, why, let's pull out all the plugs, get as many people vaccinated as we can, and that will really blunt the size of this wave. The numbers that came out, it doesn't say how many are unvaccinated, but that, again, is worth repeating. If the 795, you can be pretty sure a lot of them, if not, you know, 90-something percent are unvaccinated. That's right. This is a pandemic of the unvaccinated. And the thing about uh, on the unvaccinated is that they're not a, a homogeneous bunch. They're quite diverse, and uh, many I'm quite sympathetic towards. Um, and also, uh, they're not evenly distributed across the population. Unvaccinated people tend to be clustered geographically and socially linked. So it tends to, the disease, once it's in a particular social network, will plow through that network in, in explosive clusters. That's kind of what we're seeing. You worried about uh, another variant uh, exploding as we try and just, you know, fight off the effects of, of Delta? Uh, that's always a concern, uh, but I don't spend a lot of time worrying about it. That We have experts who are monitoring that. And so long as the disease is percolating in some part of the world, they become variant farms. However, every single variant we've seen so far is fightable by our vaccines. Our vaccines are effective against all of them. No, we haven't seen yet a variant of high consequence, a VOHC as we call it. Everything has topped off at VOC, variant of concern, and that's okay. It means that our vaccines and therapeutics still work. They just get more contagious along the way so far. Well, that's one potential for a variant. Um, the way we rank the VOI versus VOC versus VOHC is based upon does the variant compromise our ability to detect, prevent, and treat uh, the disease? And so far, they've all compromised us to some extent, but not a high extent. So again, the solution is vaccinate, vaccinate, vaccinate. If, you, if everyone's vaccinated, we cannot produce more variants. How many times you said that? In the last <laughs> <season>? <laughs> I'd say it in my sleep now. Yeah, yeah. Well, and it, and we can, it's worth repeating because we're not quite at 90%. Dr. Ray Watt, DNN, thank you, sir. Appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Epidemiologist, science communicator at the University of Ottawa.